and I decided, well, and I'm going to do this with Roger. I, I, I have to ask Martin Armstrong. <laughs> well, you, you, if you don't ask, he's certainly not going to show up. And um, and just yesterday, I got a I got a message. So we have to explain to the people who who is Martin Armstrong, uh, and some of your viewers and mm-hmm. mine would know him because we're we're mentioning him. And but the broader audience, I don't think so. So. Um, uh, his office connected me to me yesterday and I interviewed him just before we got started. Um, not on Zoom, so it was on, on phone, on cell phone. So we're going to play that uh, back in a moment. Now, my introduction to Martin Armstrong would be this. Um, the financial crisis in 2008 opened my eyes and I, I started reading history and started going back to school, just self-educate myself. I didn't want to go through not knowing what was going on ever again. And one of my heroes, one of the people I found providing information is a historian, Erik Mekking in the Netherlands. And I actually visited him once and he showed me a document that Martin Armstrong wrote in jail. <laughs> it's all, it's just time, I think it's called. And it was handwritten or just typewritten. And, and Mekking said, well, this guy, you really need to learn about Martin Armstrong. He's looked at all financial systems, flows, international connections, back in history, back in Roman ages. But he's looked he's looked at cycles in the sun. He sees cycles in everything. And he, he correlates those. And he's the only one doing that. He's actually a computer programmer. He's put all that information in a computer. And um, he's actually got the coolest source code in the world. And he said that to me because I've worked all my life in ICT and I had never heard of Martin Armstrong. <laughs> So this historian told me about Martin Armstrong and I started following him. And he's one of the authorities out there that I really try to read everything off that he posts. And now he agreed to be on, <laughs> on our show. I just interviewed him. Would you add to this introduction, what you? What would you say? Yeah, I've followed Martin for a long time. Uh, so yeah, he created this AI software that inputs data going back thousands of years that no one has done anything like this. And it had such an accurate record forecasting the future that I think the CIA approached him and said, hey, give me give me your life's work. And he's like, you crazy? Uh, and they put, put him into jail on trumped up charges for a number of years. And he got out, I think, a decade ago and resumed his, his work. Uh, and you subscribe to his reports and, and, and his service. I think he's got a conference uh, coming up uh, in exactly a month where you can attend in person or, or stream online. And he has extremely accurate uh, forecasts. And he's worked with uh, central banks and leaders of, uh, you know, presidents and prime ministers from all around the world. So he's a very serious person. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think this is going to be interesting. Okay, here we go. Okay, so my guest here is Mr. Martin Armstrong. Um, I, I got to know you through a historian in the Netherlands. Who introduced you as a programmer and I, I hadn't heard of Martin Armstrong he said well you should you're, you're an IT person but if I look in Wikipedia and stuff you're called an economic forecaster if you're introduced Martin how would you describe your area of expertise well I, I guess it mainly has been I was a trader so it, it's more from the economic side I suppose um, Actually, I was speaking at one of the market technicians uh, in Chicago when Milton Friedman came up to me. And I was pretty much the, the one of the top analysts in foreign exchange worldwide. <clears throat> so back when they were even forming the G5 in 1985, I was one of the people they called in for that. Uh, and it was Milton who basically told me, he said, look, what you're doing is something that uh, he only dreamed about, and I was kind of really surprised. But um, then I realized he had written a book in 1953 about the floating exchange rate system. So um, <clears throat> because we did foreign exchange, we had basically offices around the world from you know Geneva and London and and, and Japan and, and China. I mean everywhere. So because that was the major issue. So. When I was younger, I also happened to have, uh, my father was a lawyer and he was trying to push me into law. So I, 
I have a good background in law too, but yeah. uh, I was more interested in trading. So he then pushed me into programming. So then I got into artificial intelligence and uh, that I created our system uh, what we named Socrates. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, and yeah. That, that's what Eric Macking been, said. You, you, wrote, you, you wrote the best software in the world, basically, with that program Socrates. We'll get to that, what that thing does in, in, a, in a moment. Now, my, my first question to you is in this changed time uh, over the last half year at the least um, what Socrates does is analyze pretty much everything and, and find cyclical movements and um, you know you use them or use that program to, to forecast future events now we're in a situation with the coronavirus I was wondering does this corona situation in itself follow a cycle that you have determined uh, disease, yes. Basically, a cycle to just about everything. Um, the, the real, I mean, this is not a a real, you know, serious event. They're, they're using it politically. Um, I mean, all you have to do is look at the death rate. It's no greater than even the flu. Uh, a serious issue is when you're really like looking at the Spanish flu or something like that. And you're, you know, if 10, 15% of the population is actually dying, now you got a real serious issue. Uh, we don't see that, um, even remotely coming up. I mean, the first real disease cycle kicks in around 2022. Um, so, I mean, this one is not even as bad as the 2017 flu. Okay, thanks. Um, I've been reading your blogs, uh, ArmstrongEconomics.com, and uh, on there, at least once, but I think you do it more often than that, you say we have to crash and burn before we can reach something good again. Now, I was wondering, is that scenario, like we need to crash and burn before we can build again, has it changed by this virus and the measures taken? Uh, in other words, has Socrates made changes to its longer-term prediction? of the future based on the events of the last half year? No, actually what they are doing is, I mean, uh, they are deliberately trying to crash the economy to create this great new reset. Um, and in doing so, you're not only wiping out small businesses and things of this nature. Uh, so economically, Socrates has been showing that we're in a contraction into 2022. But it has also been forecasting, and I've put out for the last probably 10 years even, that this particular cycle would be a commodity cycle in the agricultural side. Um, and that it was showing that we would be in a period of going into shortages. Ironically, this is exactly what these people have created. Uh, by all these lockdowns and things of this nature, uh, there is shortages of food developing uh, around the world. I mean, from China, Africa, I mean, there's been food riots down there. Uh, even in the United States, there was, you know, periods where we couldn't find a lot of different things. And now you have the EU moving in to uh, ban like fertilizers and things of this nature, which will seriously reduce the the output of, of agricultural crops around the world. Yeah. So I'm in Europe. I'm in the Netherlands. Uh, just this evening, my prime minister has had his, another of his press conferences um, warning us for curfews happening and restricting us from, I believe we're not even allowed to be outside as parents with our kid if, if, if the child is over 14. <laughs> so there's measures outside of any reasonable correlation with the, with present, preventing a virus. So this leads into a question. We see lockdowns everywhere and riots in Europe. And then the World Economic Forum's Forum has presented plans. And the IMF is mentioning a great reset now and mentioning we need a Bretton Woods too. <laughs> I was wondering, have these signals have 
had an impact on the flow of money because that's what Socrates is taking in. It, you, you're looking at the, at the flow of big money over the world. Have what ha- have been happening over the last months have uh, an impact of the flow of big money throughout the world? Yes, it's, it's confirming more or less what the trend has been. Um, and that um, a lot of it will, I think, also be accelerated depending upon the, you know, the presidential election outcome here. Uh, but, I mean, what is going on with these people is that this great reset, uh, I mean, has been orchestrated, honestly. And, you know, the center has been the World Economic Forum. And this is all uh, quite astonishing, really. But, I mean, Klaus Schwab, you can look on on YouTube. He's put out his eight predictions for 2030. Mm -hmm. And it's a communistic world. This is what the academics tend to always want to create. Um, And his number one thing is you will own nothing. All right, you'll rent everything. He wants to eliminate property um, and fossil fuels. You won't eat meat anymore. Um, I mean, <clears throat> honestly, if I did what these people did, I'd be in prison for the probably, you know, multiple lifetimes. You have Bill Gates and everybody standing up. And what do they have investments in? You know, you know meat substitutes. Uh, he's put in, you know, investments in everything that they're pitching. Shut down meat plants, do this, do that. It all benefits whatever they have. Um, I mean, it's the greatest inside, you know, trading scam, I think, in, in the history of, of, of human <laughs> recorded time. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's and I really think, look, I have, worked with governments around the world for for 40 years. I mean, I was one of the ones who was called in by China to help them become uh, a capitalistic system. Um, it was very, very interesting, you know, meeting with central banks there. I, you know, I probably have met with more central banks than anybody, I think, in the world, really. Um, and because they all know we have this computer, and it's not my personal opinion, and it's monitoring everything in the world, uh, every market, every buy market, agriculture, capital flows, uh, weather, diseases, uh, uh, even natural disasters are, are in there. I mean, all these things are what is really behind the business cycle. Uh, it's not any individual thing. And the same thing with these climate uh change people. I mean, it's really absurd. You know, they all oh, CO2. I mean, it's just look on the uh, NASA website, what percent of the atmosphere is CO2. It's 0.04%. That's it. All right. They act like the world is going to end because of this. And they don't do any analysis prior to 1850. And, the, you know, I mean, there's plenty of data that comes from ice core samples. Um, there's always been a cyclical atmosphere. And <clears throat> the, it's been, you know, clearly shown that there's a 300-year cycle um, that the sun beats like your heart. It increases uh, in magnitude and decreases uh, <clears throat> in uh History, we have the poles flip. On Earth, it tends to be, the last one was about 41,000 years ago. But on the sun, they flip every 11 years. Um, of course, nobody lives there, so we don't really know what happens. But um, there, you know, when we go into so minimum, the correlations are very clear. I mean, what comes out of the sun then is an increase in gamma rays. And a lot of people believe that perhaps that's why earthquakes and volcanoes tend to correspond to when you're in solar minimum. Yeah, um, okay, okay. That maybe the gamma rays penetrate the earth more. So there's so much more that we're just scratching the surface. And you can never <clears throat> reduce everything down to a single cause and effect. 
And I think that's what our number one problem is in Western society. It's, it's a complex thing that's more like a, a, a rainforest. You know, it's, it's, every species is interrelated to everything else. I mean, it's not just simply one thing. And what we're doing tonight, so our computer is showing that. What we are doing tonight is um, creating also a presidential election broadcast. But unlike all the other ones, <laughs> we're not focusing on, on Biden or Trump. Like we're focusing on the effect of, of all these things that you just mentioned also. And um, would it even matter if, if Biden or Trump was, were elected and, and would they be able to change this? So if, if we go back to the economic side of things, well, obviously they won't be able to change the cycle of the sun. But the, the, the statements made by World Economic Forum, by IMF, the corona measures that we're in, do you feel those being tied into Trump or Biden be elected? In other words, would either candidate be able to change the course of the EMF or World Economic Forum, you think? No, what, what we really have uh, at stake is that the uh, ECB there in Europe lowered interest rates to negative in 2014. So here we are six years later, and they still have been unable to stimulate the economy or get inflation to 2%. Why? Because all the economic theories that they have are failing. And you have to look at it from a, a, this perspective. Um, what have they, you know, they've done is they basically have destroyed uh, the European bond market. The same thing in Japan. Uh, this is why the U.S. Treasuries are basically the only real thing in, you know, game in town. Um, but the central bank is trapped. It cannot now raise interest rates without blowing up its own portfolio. The member states cannot continue to sell bonds. The ECB is the one that buys them up um, at negative rates. So the only way out of this is really what they're uh, – our computer has been forecasting and we're going into a monetary crisis cycle. They will, talking about moving into an electronic uh, digital euro, banning, you know, Bitcoin, et cetera, which is uh, logical because they're really trying to get all the cash, prevent people from hoarding money and push it into the banks because they're not interested in bailing out the banks anymore. So uh, all this is basically designed what they will do. And if you look at what Schwab is saying, you will own nothing. All right. <clears throat> this is basically the agenda is that what they will do is really default on the bonds. Now, I've been pushing that they should at least declare them to be perpetual bonds where you, you get an interest, you know, and I've said it should be basically made at 3% uh, to pay out an interest or I find the bonds are no longer uh, redeemable, per se, uh, more or less like the British consuls. Now, the other side of the coin is what Schwab is, and that is basically just default, period. Um, and that's what he's really saying, you will own nothing. So they no longer have to uh, issue debt, roll it at all the time. So this is basically a bailout of everything. Um, and that's what they're really talking about. A new Brenton Woods, etc. There is no way to fix the current system. Uh, they are, since World War II, all they have been doing is borrowing year after year after year with no intention of ever paying anything back. And um, you can go to our site and you'll see that we, if you just calculate the cumulative interest that they have paid, all right, um, you get the, you know, the left wing say, oh, you know, the capitalists and the money, 70 up to 70 percent of the debt. And even this is applied to Germany before they start lowering these rates was not money that went to schools or roads, it went to interest. 
That was it. So this system has failed. And how do you get out of it? Uh, I'm trying to at least retain democracy, et cetera. These lockdowns are basically about destroying the economy. Uh, you've already wiped out about a third of small businesses. And just look at what Johnson, you know, what they just did in Britain. Um, lockdown basically saying, well, he's not guaranteeing it will be lifted at any point in time. They're going to wipe out Christmas. Um, he's now made it against the law for more than two people to go out. <clears throat> uh, and you're giving everybody an 80% of what their salary was because he's, he's destroyed their jobs. What they also now, said, nobody in, in their right mind would do this. Yeah. He said, um, you'll own nothing. But then the sentence continued and they said, you'll own nothing and you'll be happier about it. Well, what, yeah. what came to mind for me was, well, if you continue these measures, well, whatever comes after will make everybody happier. So they're making us miserable. So th th their solution would be more <laughs> accepted, maybe. Uh, you, if I understand. If yeah, you, basically what they're trying to do is they wipe out everybody's jobs, etc. They think that then you'll be satisfied by simply giving you um, some money and you food. stay home and watch TV. Yeah, exactly. Now, another, uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, another yeah. thing that came up was the G20. G20 finance officials set November 13th a meeting to finalize debt framework. So is, is this into, into, entwined? Is, is this the plan World Economic Forum is also pitching? And in, in, in your opinion, would that be then make outstanding debt perpetual with zero interest rate or would they go with your plan at least normalize interest rates? What do you think? Are, are they up to November 13th? Um, I think they're probably going to follow Schwab. Uh, he's got a lot more uh, pull, I would say. Um, just look at his board of directors. I mean, Christine Lagarde's on his on the board of the World Economic Forum. Um uh, so, you know, Al Gore, uh, I mean, he's got <clears throat> these people basically eating out of his hand. He talks to Christine Lagarde all the time. Now, I can tell you that nobody will, in the actual press, is willing to, to stick their neck out and investigate. But if you look at it, Bill Gates started selling his stock in December last year, ahead of the crash. World Economic Forum. They sold out everything, all right? And Schwab, I can't say, told somebody, well, he didn't want to appear to be greedy. This has been organized. It's been an intentional attack on the world economy to change it. And this is not something that, oh, gee, look at this. Well, let's figure out how we can make it better. And they intended to do this. Um <clears throat> And like I said, I've worked with politicians my whole life. And for years, I mean, I would say, if we don't do this, it's going to crash. All right. And they still do it. All right. Because a politician is different. I can't run for president and say, vote for me because I saved your job. You're going to look at me and like, well, how do I know I would have lost it? All right. But, Nobody can win election that way. But you, it's better you lose your job, and then I say, "Vote for me." I'll get the guy that did it. What, um, what, what, so what? they love crisis. What you also said is, back in the day, you were called in to assess uh, a new presidential candidates. Uh, I'm I'm assuming that that stopped before. Well, maybe maybe you, you were also asked to, to assess Biden at a certain point, but if you were. <laughs> If you were to give an opinion on Donald Trump or Joe Biden, what would it be at this time? Oh, uh, Trump, uh, absolutely. I mean, the major difference is this, is that, I mean, I know for a fact all the allegations about Biden and Ukraine and China, I know they're absolutely 100% correct because I know people on the opposite side. Uh, but forget the corruption side. The difference between a career politician and somebody like Trump uh, is that Trump 
has to return to a private business. So he's never going to pass some sort of law that's so draconian that's going to affect himself. Whereas a career politician does not return to anything. They just get speaking fees and they live off of the government for free. So uh, I've studied many different types of government. And the best one was the Republic in, in Genoa. The Doge, or like president, rotated on an annual basis. And it was a member of all the richest families. But it might be 30 years by the time your family came back into power. But that kept things legitimate because nobody would, again, pass a law that they would be subjected to themselves the following year. And it wasn't this class warfare stuff that we hear. Um, and, and ever since Marx, it's all, you know, us against them. They try to divide people. Um, and I mean, you can look at, uh, what was really the truth was the unemployment of blacks was at the lowest historical ever in December. Um, yeah. so this has been all orchestrated to crash the economy so they really can rebuild it. It's kind of like Nero, you know, what they say, you know, fiddling while Rome burns. So that slogan... This is basically what they're doing. That slogan that they come up with, build back better, that, that wasn't a lie. That's, that's their intention. <laughs> right? Um, yes. I mean, you know... It's not better for me. Schwab put out his, his fourth, you know, uh, industrial revolution nobody ever designed the other ones. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. he thinks, oh, okay, fine. You know, we can, you know, create uh, artificial intelligence. We'll, we'll replace all these different things. Um, look, I have a, a computer that will replace basically every analyst. It will, it, you could use it to even replace um, the legal system, even, even you know, politicians. So basically um, what he's doing is fighting the cycles then, or no? He's yes. I mean, look, it's, you know, he, you look at his promo piece and, oh, it's equality, inclusion. This is the same, you know, pitch that they used, you know, for the Russian revolution. I mean, it's just nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, oh, he wants to bring equality. Are you going to give up all your assets and take off your sashes and your medals and, and, you know, go walk on the streets with everybody else? Of course not. Um, we are the great unwashed. We're too stupid to know what's good for us. So it takes these super intelligent beings like him, Gates, and Soros, and others uh, to be on top to make sure that we have a good life. In, uh, uh, this is their, their idea. In one of your n newsletters uh, your, uh, or your blog entries, people can follow them for free, which is great, M Martin Armstrong or ArsenalEconomics.com, uh, you said, you, you talked about Bitcoin. You mentioned that a moment ago as well. And you said, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is not going to be allowed. <laughs> and I thought, well, how are they going to stop it then? But then the other day, like last week, I tried to sell a little bit. And then what you get in the Netherlands, and it's European law, is that you're supposed to show where you got them. <laughs> well, that's new. You never had to show where you got your euros or your dollars, but now you have to show how, 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 you, how you got your euros. And then... Uh, the trading company is, is, is supposed to um, make sure that you're not whitewashing your um, your money laundering your, uh, your your bitcoins. So that that's the easy way to 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 prevent people fleeing to Bitcoin, maybe. Um, but at the same time, I hear reports that Iran is now trying to trade or own or use Bitcoin. Um, do you still see Bitcoin being not allowed as an international player, or how do you see that? Has that changed? No, I mean, <clears throat> um, I mean, from the beginning, I warned people: look, <clears throat> they are just allowing it, so they have they're following it to see how it works, and then they will replace it themselves. They are not going to allow competition. They don't allow anybody else to print. You know, money, it's it's a monopoly. <clears throat> China has already outlawed Bitcoin. That's it. Uh, we had, <clears throat> we, were, we were taking 
We have other services where our clients can get into Socrates. And simply because Socrates was forecasting Bitcoin, Europe said we were not allowed to take any money on any other service as long as we have Bitcoin. We had to move everything. We had to shut down our services in Europe and move, move them to the United States because of simply one. And we told them, we're only forecasting Bitcoin. We're not selling it. Didn't matter. They're afraid of it, though, then, aren't they? Yes, sir. Look, that gold, anything that they see as a, a place that money can seep out of the system. Uh, so the, the digital euro they want it eliminates bank runs. You can't go to the bank and, and say, you know, you know, give me all my money out of the account. How are you going to get it out? Digital. Um, <laughs> um, you can't go down there with a you know flash drive and say, here, put it all on there. You know, um, it, it this is just the way it is. I was thinking. Uh, I was thinking that digital. So, That digital euro or digital dollar or central bank digital currency, that it was maybe another year or two years be, be, before it would be here. But given the speed with the way things are developing now, I'm, I wouldn't even be surprised if we'd see it in January. What's your take on when we will see that introduced? Um, no, our information is that they were looking to do it by January. Okay. Okay. Final Extremely rapidly. And particularly if if uh, if Bush wins, I mean, if Trump wins, then what will happen is they're going to move at lightning speed because they're going to afraid that capital is going to be leaving Europe and running to the United States. If, if <clears throat> Biden wins, then uh, he's already stated that he will rejoin the UN because um, he'll just join on with everything else that's going on in Europe. Um, and he'll be extending lockdowns, etc. over here as well. Okay. So, okay, let's, uh, final question that I, yeah, I have two questions. So what I also read on your site and on the, on the, on the newsletters that you send out is uh, information about how to trade a vertical market. So, Whichever president wins tonight, that might trigger those vertical markets you were talking about, wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, uh, I don't know if you're going to know who actually won tonight. Um, uh, there is indications that there are a lot more people uh, out there for Trump than the polls claim. I, I, I think it's the same thing as, as Brexit. I think the polls are just being manipulated to try and convince people to, to vote for, for Biden. But, um, I mean, you, you go out there, uh, I went, voted this morning and all you saw was people out there, you know, when you left, they got, did you vote for Trump? You know, that was it. I didn't see anybody out there with Biden signs. Yeah, well, the theory is they all did it by, by mail, but we'll have to see about how that evolves then. Okay, but my, my <laughs> yes, that will be interesting <laughs> because I, I think that uh, mostly the people that voted are the ones that don't trust that type of system. Yeah. So I think you know they were probably more pro-Trump than who voted actually today, um, and they were using the virus to scare. Honestly, everybody into staying home and, and and trying to blame Trump for for everything. It's just it's just crazy. But um, okay, my, my uh, but this is really what's going on. My final question would be this: Over the last couple of years, uh, I was under the assumption that it would be a big bank, um, Monte Apache in Italy, or even Deutsche Bank would go under and then we'd be back in 2008 on steroids. Now with all the money printing and you've been talking about the repo market, that the interventions there, and I've seen money go, uh, the, the new support packages in the European Union, no bank, this is just my feeling, no bank is going to be allowed to fail anymore. They'll just print whatever uh, they need to be. So they need to, to, to perpetuate this system. Now, What we are going through now, what is unfolding now, um, 
Is that new in the history of the world? Are there parallels? Uh, yes. I mean, even if you look at um, the Rome, for example, you know, Rome didn't have a national debt. Uh, so uh, as far as a, a, a real major debt crisis, this is probably the first time in history for that. Um, there have been private you know, debt crises over the centuries, but uh, we're looking at this stage in the game at, at really uh, the governments have gone too far. The system does not work. And that's what this great reset is really about. And, and that's why they've been able to just sell it. Um, it it's like I said, I, I've worked with politicians for such a long time. Somebody would, like Johnson, you know, uh, what he's just done in, in London, he's basically destroying the economy. A third of small businesses are gone. By the time he's done, he'll wipe out the rest. And so you have to ask, he knows what has happened. Why would he do this again? All right. He has no intention of worrying about running for election. Um, <clears throat> I've been given, you know, internal memos from Germany. They're already planning to postpone the elections there as well. Uh, we may not see elections again. And um, this is all built up into this crisis, et cetera. And uh, it's really about government because they were going to fail. But uh, should, should Trump win big, like not, not contest it? He would not go along with this, but would he be able to just change these plans or put a stop to them, or is it going to play out anyway? What do you think? I, I think it's going to play out anyway. I mean, all he can do is basically stand up and offer an alternative. Um, they are, uh, you'll see a lot of capital just basically flee Europe in, in that case. And, uh, but their grand plan with this great reset is to overthrow Trump. Then they have the nuclear power of the United States. And, and Biden even said it in his uh, in the debate. He would rejoin the U.N. and use that power to force China to comply. Um, this is what they're really trying to do. And I think it's seriously, seriously wrong. Uh, and they're going to put a risk of, of international war and I, and the computer showing probably by 2027. So you're not going to be able to force the rest of the world to com comply with this new, you know, great reset. Um, it's just, it's absurd. It's just completely absurd. You can't get politicians in parliament or Congress to ever agree a hundred percent. So. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get the entire world to agree to this great reset? I mean, it's just not going to, not plausible. Well, yeah, that is the question that I have when I see my prime minister on television. So, well, well why, why is he doing this and not being honest or taking the, well, obviously we're a very small country. What, what can he do? At least he could be honest. <laughs> He's not doing that. So I, they, to me, they have clearly been bribing the top politicians in the major countries that they need to. Uh, and then the others are on, well, I don't know, they're do it. So I guess we'd follow that as well. Uh, but I, I'm telling you, I've worked with politicians way too long. I've had enough of them <laughs> and <clears throat> they do not do anything proactive. They prefer crisis. So therefore there's no way they would be doing this, Oh, to prevent a disease. No, they're doing this because they've been paid. And the only question is, what have they been bribed in? You know, euros, dollars, British pounds, Bitcoin. What? What is it? What are they taking? <laughs> this is. Oh, we're going to ask them. We, we're going. To, there, there's going to be a point in time where we are going to ask them that. So that's my hope for the future. Martin Armstrong. Just my last question. Then, have you voted already or no? Yes, I did. I was down there first. Seven o'clock in the morning. So, would you tell us what you voted for? Who you voted for? I voted for Trump because it's 
again, I don't think this election is is traditional in the sense of one personality versus another. It's an agenda. Um, and that's what I'm looking at. I don't care how many tweets uh, Trump does. I mean, at least I know that he's not going to do something drastic because he has the business he has to return to. <laughs> it's true. Martin Armstrong, thank you so much for talking to us. Stay in good health. Well, thank you for inviting me and good luck over there. <laughs> that was fun. Is your mic back on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are we live now? Yeah, we're live. Oh, all right. What do you think? I mean, I couldn't get Martin Armstrong on, and and you did, so I'm I'm jealous. <laughs> oh, we've been competing viewers of this live stream, so uh, you you're still ahead there. You've got more viewers to this live event than than, than do I. However, I have to welcome another group of people in here as well. So there's the geopolitics and empire group of supporters that's you that's your <laughs> that's your fan base where are they located all over do you know all over the planet i guess i would assume mostly united states i mean you're doing all english you're, you're i get it. messages from australia um europe yeah so on so so my my broadcasts are these days mostly dutch and whenever i do something english like now i, I would <laughs> I'm naive, maybe, but I think everybody in, in the Netherlands knows f speaks fluent English, but it's not the case. So a large part of my audience doesn't know what we're talking about. And then I go off, well, this is a brilliant interview. You have to watch this. And they go, yeah, I don't understand it. Can you create subtitles? <laughs> well, that's, that's a tremendous amount of work. But I really would have everybody watch Armstrong. This was a good conversation. One, one. And check, check out his uh, documentary forecaster which tells us about the story of what, what happened to him so yeah yeah the forecaster the thing is it, it has been sh on dutch television also and i grabbed it off the internet before that but then it was on dutch tv and it was redacted the, a part in the middle was cut out and that was the part where uh, martin armstrong drew a drawing and said how that banker safra was killed and how Putin got into, into Putin got into power after the USSR fell. So that would be the high po point of, of that documentary. And uh, and they decided to cut it out on Dutch television. I never bothered to ask. They would probably say, yeah, we had to cut it out to so and so many minutes. Yeah, right. That was <laughs> I'm not buying that. Um, so there were some quotes in here. We could, we could, the greatest inside trading in recorded history. There, there was some insider trading taking place just before nine one one. Of course, yeah. Yeah, and um, well, even with the Corona stuff, a uh, bunch of uh, what is it, the uh, CEOs and stuff. I mean, they were selling stocks before the pandemic was declared. So, yeah, as 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 uh, uh, when I was on Spiro Skouras's show, he called it, uh, you know, COVID nineteen eighty four, a global nine eleven. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. Then another thing he said, and that I'm gonna, that I've I've been, <laughs> so tonight you're keeping me awake, but sometimes I have problems sleeping. And one of the things that are going through my mind is what Armstrong just said. Uh, we'll see, probably see, as, as, according to his computer program, we're gonna see an international war by 2027. All right, cool. I mean, that, I'm always obsessed with that because I, I see it coming. So Martin Armstrong, according to his Socrates program, says the same i just see it as inevitable and ricardo bossi the former australian special forces that i interviewed said you know and as a history teacher myself it's like what's the default state of mankind is war peace is the anomaly so that's just yeah the yeah. so thing is uh, my son is 14 now so at seven years imagine green attire <laughs> gun and that's that's the loss of that that's what's going through my mind <laughs> 